Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Alice Reed, and I am the spiritual director here. Glad to be here this morning. Glad to be, I'm also one of your practitioners this morning. What you may not know about ministers is that we are practitioners first and foremost. So I'm happy to serve you as a practitioner as well. Um, class starts this Wednesday. If that's something, classes or something that has interested you, we have um, a really wonderful deep class coming up called Exploring Our Roots, where we get an opportunity to really begin to understand where Ernest Holmes got his inspiration. And so we'll be looking at selected pieces from Ralph Waldo Emerson, from uh, Judge Thomas Troward, and from Emma Curtis Hopkins. We're putting some books together, so let us know. Don't wait too long. So here we are living out loud, and we're talking about loving out loud. And if you haven't uh, seen the new issue of the Science of Mind uh, magazine, you might notice that it's, <laughs> it's actually two issues in one. <laughs> we have decided that um, in part of our work that we do in, at the home office that we are trying to save some trees and some energy and put uh, two issues in one. It actually saves quite a lot of money and quite a lot of resources. But in this side, <laughs> loving out loud, there's a great article in here from uh, K.C. Taylor, Reverend Casey C. K. Taylor, and she talks about loving out loud. She's actually also been the inspiration for all of our themes this month. And she simply says that the, in the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes wrote, love is the self-givingness of spirit. Love isn't just the good feelings that come with being happy in our lives. Love is also the moment when everything seems to go wrong. Every moment of conflict, discord, and discontent is designed to connect us further with our personal understanding of love. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Because we live in a culture that happens to, how should I say, romanticize love quite a bit. It's in poetry, it's in songs, it's in the media we watch, whether it's television or going to see a rom-com in the movie theater, there's all this, how should I say it, projection of cultural norms, right, that show up in the, the different love songs and movies and, and media that we subscribe to, the literature that we read. And one of the things that um, I want to address this morning is how we've been conditioned to kind of pigeonhole love into one specific way it can show up. I was uh, at a concert at a Stevie Wonder, uh, what do they call those, tribute band, right? And the, the, you know, the Stevie impersonator, he wasn't pretending to be blind, thank God, but... <laughs> But he was, he was doing a beautiful s job singing his songs. And, um, and he was singing that one song about, um, you know, getting weak in his knees and, you know, loving so much. And gosh, you know, I could feel myself sort of like expand as I heard that song. Like, oh, yes, that's what I want too. <laughs> right? Right? Because it, it, it touches us. Right? It moves us as when we hear this. So as, I, as we look at this idea of loving out loud, and um, today we're looking at love without conditions, I want to suggest that we have kind of packaged this thing called love into a place where it might have some conditions, where we don't understand seeing love in anything other than the packaging that we have received through literature and songs and movies and media. And as I look at this way that we've been conditioned by our society, I was also thinking about um, one of the first authors that I really began to uh, resonate with as they talked about love. And it's a real blast from the past. His name is Leo Bascaglia. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. An amazing author, amazing speaker, and he talked about love in a way I had never heard before. He talked about love in, in so I just, actually, I'll, I'll share some of it with you. I thought that was the best way, because if you haven't experienced Leo, um, he has this one quote where he says, love and the self are one, and the discovery of either is the realization of both. And last week we talked about loving ourselves and how love, when we don't love ourselves, when there are places within us that we don't love ourselves, that sometimes we project that out and begin to do this thing that I like to refer to, as does Emma Curtis Hopkins, this thing called othering. We begin to other whatever it is we don't love in ourselves and project it out onto other people. And so Leo says, so loving yourself involves the discovery of the true wonder of you, not only the present you, but the many possibilities of you. It involves the continual realization that you are unique like no other person in the world and that life is or should be the discovery, the development, and the sharing of this uniqueness. The process is not always easy, for one is bound to find those who f will feel threatened by a change, changing, growing you. But it will always be exciting, always be fresh, and like all things new and changing, never be dull. So Leo encourages us to love ourselves, to really begin to appreciate our uniqueness, our diversity, if I will if you will, that place in us that makes us different from everyone else. And some of our differences are, are more, um, they're more easily identifiable, right? When we just look at people, you know, we have different color hair, we have different colored eyes, we have different color skin. And one of the things that has happened over the many, many years of us romanticizing love and looking at this common, you know, this common thread of what I'll call um, white heterosexual love, right? That's pretty much what we hear in songs and movies and literature. We've been conditioned to think that that's the only place that love really exists. And we've had this amazing movement in our culture over the last the first time I became aware of the shift in that, I must have been, oh, I don't know, about this tall. It had to be the 60s. And she said, there, and she pointed out a couple that was interracial. And she said, no matter what they say, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. And, it, you know, the, it, I went back into my, you know, innocence and not understanding the world of differences, but I remember that distinctly, like, what's she talking about? I don't understand, you know? What, 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 who, who cares who people love? And I, too, like you, have been conditioned with all the wonderful media that we work with to, um, to think about love and our relationships with love with someone who is like us. I looked at some statistics, and I want to share them with you, that, that over the last 50 years, the, the demographics of our country have really changed quite a bit. About one in 10 people identifies either as um, gender neutral or as LBGTQAI. Yeah, I had to practice that. And the reason I had to practice that is because I'm not in one of those initials. And so I can't, you know, while I can't speak to it from who I am, I can tell you what I've learned about the, um, the beautiful souls that I have be known and loved over the years and what they've taught me about living in a world where they didn't see themselves. My first science of mind teacher was Jeffrey Proctor, Reverend Dr. Jeffrey Proctor. And I met him in the late 90s, and I was busy raising kids and, you know, trying to get the two cars in the garage and all that stuff and just trying to do my thing. And, 
And Jeffrey was different. And um, as, as a matter of fact, my mother introduced me to him. Thank you, mother. And uh, I learned that he was gay. And I remember, like, you know, I didn't really have any awareness of differences or how difficult it was for individuals who were gay to be in our culture. I didn't realize the, the um, oppression that people who love differently had to experience. And Jeffrey taught me that. But he taught it to me in a really loving way. He taught it to me by being authentically who he is. And I, his husband, Don Gilson, became a very dear friend of mine. And he also taught me through compassionate listening and through curiosity and through inquiry about what it was like for him so that I could be more compassionate because I am white and heterosexual, and so I do see myself in the literature and the songs and the, the things that are about me. And so I didn't, have, I didn't have that perspective. I didn't have the perspective of what it would be like not to see yourself anywhere. The Silomar was, was happening, and there was this dance party at the end of every Silomar conference. And so Jeffrey and Don were so much in love and so the dance party was happening, and a slow song came on, and they went to start to dance with one another. And somebody in authority came up and whispered in their ear, if you want to get ahead, you shouldn't do this. Oh. Now, I, I'm not going to tell you who it was. That person is amazing and open-minded now. But at the time, at the time, they were a product of all of this that I'm sharing with you, this, this enculturation that we've had over the last 50, well, before that, but you know, this enculturation that we've had for, well, I don't know how many hundreds of years about heterosexual loving. Don also told me a great story about when they candidated for the Baltimore church that I came up in. And so they were coming from another state, and, they were, and when you candidate, well, that means that you come and you do a talk for people, and, you <clears throat> and they get to know you. And Don said he purposely wore a shirt that was unbuttoned down to here. <laughs> and he showed up as who he was, and he said, they're either going to love us or they're not. Thank God for the brave souls who have chosen to be authentic because they are the ones who have helped to change the course and the tide of how we experience. I, I venture to say that if you're listening to me, if you're here today, you're probably okay with people who love differently than you. You're probably comfortable with that. There may be places inside you that aren't comfortable with that, that you're not aware of. As we look at this idea of loving without condition, what we're really talking about, and, and it may sound easy, sure, I love everybody. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have anything against anybody. But if you're watching that, gosh, there's a couple of really interesting TV shows that have come out on Netflix, and I'm gonna tell you my own thing. There's one that's very graphic about a gentleman who's on the spectrum who is gay and is exploring love for the first time with same-sex partners. And it's graphic. It's, it's not who I am, but I know that it's who about 10% of our population are. They love differently than us. And so my work is to look at that place where I'm a little uncomfortable. I wouldn't be uncomfortable watching a man and a woman like that. <coughs> well, maybe you would. <laughs> a couple of you would. I mean, it wasn't pornography by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, should I tell this story? <laughs> my, my son was about eight years old, and he was over at a friend's house watching Top Gun, right? And there's that love scene in Top Gun where the, you know, Tom Cruise and Megan can't remember her last name or are you know, they're having this love scene, and it's not real graphic, but at like eight years old, my friend told me she watched my son as she leaned over to his buddy and said, don't worry, 
they're using artificial body parts. <laughs> <laughs> and we knew it was time to have the talk with him, <laughs> to talk about um, how love works sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my point is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get, and the scenes were, were like that, if you will, and so I wouldn't get uncomfortable seeing a, you know, a, a man and a woman like that, but I noticed my discomfort. And so the, I, what I'm suggesting here is that when we notice any discomfort, it's an opportunity for us to lean into love. You don't have to do it. <laughs> you don't have to understand it, but maybe be compassionate about how other people love. Jeffrey used to say that love is love and the rest is plumbing. <laughs> right? And I love that because when, when I first started really getting um, uh, to know and to be deep, have a deep friendship with Jeffrey and with Don, I can remember the sort of the puzzling in my head, like, well, I don't really get it, but why does this matter? You know, I love these people. And so that's just one example. I mean, I could, I could go on to all the different, you know, I was looking at all these stats of who we are as a nation and, you know, one in 10 of us is probably LGBTQ. One of, you know, 19% of us are Latino, 13.6% of us are black, 7% are Asian, 63% um, of us identify as non-Christian. Um, you know, our population has really shifted in the last 50 years. And I don't have any evidence to this, because I looked, but I couldn't find any, but I want to venture to guess that our census over the last 50 years have not been really accurate. Mm. Um, there's a, a, a code that they use in the census called the HTC populations. Those are the ones that are hard to count. Those are the minorities, people in poverty, people who are homeless, immigrants that might be illegal, people who primarily speak a different language and youth. And so I think we've gotten, a, I think a combination of getting better at counting <laughs> and doing the census and a combination of people feeling safer to be different than what is the perceived norm, have given us clearer numbers about who we are. I mean, and if you look at the world population, it's very diverse. But if you look around this room, not so much. <laughs> Except if you begin to inquire and get to know people and you start to see who they are and the different preferences they have and the, the different likes and the dislikes or the, the occupations or the marital status or the age that we have. I mean, there's, there's lots of invisible ways that we're diverse as well. And so this idea of loving without conditions is an invitation for us to explore where we do have conditions where we do this thing called othering. Um, of course, in the last, I don't know, 20, since 2016, it's been up around political differences, right? There's been a lot of othering around that. And I think social media has added to that because it's really easy for me to just type out an opinion and go do the dishes as opposed to look you in the eye and talk about it, right? And so our work as metaphysicians, our work as individuals who want to be conscious and conscious lovers is to open our minds and look for the places that we might have bias, look for the places we might accidentally do, or I'll say it this way, subtly do this thing called othering, to begin to bring ourselves back to a place of compassion and understanding. I. Um, I know that our culture right now is trying to give voice to a lot of the, what we would call minority populations, the, the Asian populations, the black population, the LBGTQ populations. Like they're, they're getting more press, if you will. They're, 
there. And I, I remember, you know, one of, I'm such a cornball. One of my favorite shows when it was on was Glee. I just loved Glee. It was so much fun. And I remember a Christmas, you know, the Christmas special, and it was Christmas classic. And the, um, <coughs> oh, Kurt begins to sing James Taylor and, you know, somebody. But, but here was this different example for me to look at. Um, it was a, a way for me to open my mind, to see things in a different light. And, and so when you see that, when you see this prevalence, while we might categorize, categorize these different populations of minorities, it's time for us to see everyone. It's time for us to see all of us, not just the perceived norm, so that we can expand ourselves and begin to press into those places. And, and what I want to say is when we begin to do this practice of loving without condition, which means having an open mind and having a broader sense of, of the differences that are around us, it, it begins to expand us in a way, just like that quote that, that Leo has here, when, when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gender neutralize this, <laughs> when a person has love, they are no longer at the mercy of the forces greater than themselves, for they themselves become the powerful force of love, right? When we begin to let go of our sense of otherness. The other thing that, that kind of came up for me as I was thinking about this topic of loving without condition is that as I begin to open my mind and to be more um, broadly inclusive about the different ways that people are in our society, it actually brings me to a closer sense of oneness. And that seems kind of paradoxical, I know. But what happens is I begin, I first start by seeing the differences, and then I begin to see similarities, right? Because I've gotten past the difference part. I've, I've accepted it, I've integrated it, and so then I can see the oneness. But I think it's valuable for us to press into those places where we, we might have conditions. Now, I, I know this idea of loving um, without condition, you know, kind of lends itself to things about a romantic relationship and loving your partner unconditionally, but I'm really talking about humanity here. I'm not really talking about romantic love. I'm talking about that agape love. I'm talking about this kind of love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up. Its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. And my experience with love, that of course is Corinthians. You probably, some of you may have heard it before, or at least the, that last line. Um, and my experience with love is that love dissolves everything unlike it, not to become the same, but to embrace it all. Not to do away with the things that, or destroy the things that are unlike it, but to embrace life with its power and its grace. And so as we, as we catch these places, sometimes it's just about catching and plucking out these places where we might have exceptions to God as love. It's our opportunity to, um, to, take the, to pluck them out, to, to get them clear, and we do that through this power of love. Ernest Holmes has a great quote about love. He says, the essence of love, while elusive, pervades everything, fires the heart, stimulates the emotions, renews the soul, and pro proclaims the spirit. Only, know, only love knows love, and love knows only love. Words cannot express its depth or meaning. A universal sense alone bears witness to the divine fact, God is love, and love is God. It's big. This thing called love is big. 
you know, we could probably talk about it all year. But we're only going to talk about it for a month. I kind of want to end my talk with you today to share with you this sweet video with Thich Nhat Hanh. And so Mary, if you could get that started. We need to turn it up, get to change the volume around. Be uh, beautiful, be yourself. Sei schön, sei du selbst. We have to accept uh, what we are, a lotus is beautiful as a lotus. She doesn't have to, to become a rose in order to be beautiful. Wir müssen das akzeptieren, was wir sind. Ein, eine Lotusblume ist schön als Lotusblume und sie muss nicht eine, zu einer Rose werden, um, um schön zu sein. And to be a, a gay or a lesbian is equally beautiful. Und schwul oder lesbisch zu sein ist genauso gleich schön. And we should not be uh, caught by words and notions. Und wir sollten nicht uh, in Worten oder Vorstellungen gefangen sein. Everything that we see manifests uh, uh, the wonders of, uh, of God, of the ultimate reality. Und alles, was wir sind, das sind, äh, ist eine Manifestation von Gott, von der ultimativen Wirklichkeit. Wir müssen all, jeder Sache und jedem Menschen mit dem größtmöglichen Respekt begegnen. Um, people say that I am a man, but I am not sure. <lacht> Die Leute sagen, ich sei ein Mann, aber ich bin mir da nicht so sicher. Because I behave uh, very often like a mother. Weil ich mich sehr oft wie eine Mutter verhalte. My disciples see in me uh, a father, a teacher and a mother at the same time. Und meine, meine Schüler, die sehen in mir einen Vater, einen Lehrer und eine Mutter und alles gleichzeitig. And I enjoy being a mother. <laughs> und ich genieße es, eine Mutter zu sein. So let us not be caught by words and concepts. Lasst uns also nicht in Worten und Vorstellungen gefangen sein. Uh, uh, in uh, Buddhism we have the word uh, suchness. It means uh, reality as it is. You cannot use any concept or any word in order to describe it. Im Buddhismus, da haben wir den Begriff des So-Seins und man kann keine Worte oder Vorstellungen benutzen, um das zu beschreiben. Beautiful. He, you know, I could have just shown you that, we could have gone home. But, <laughs> but, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh really does describe this, this opportunity we have day in and day out to practice suchness, to see each other exactly as we are, unique, whole, perfect, and complete. And so my invitation to you this week is to Find those small little subtle places where you may be holding on to otherness and apply love. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so let's pray. I get to pray with you twice today. What a treat. So as I lower my eyes and my gaze, I invite you to do the same. To let go of all the conditions and the, the things that we see around us and to come into that one infinite reality that knows no time or space, 
knows no condition or effect. It just pours itself into life. For as our psalm says, love is the givingness of God to itself. And I know that each one of us is so divinely connected with that purpose that not only is it a joy to be loved and to know that we are loved, but it is a joy to love as well. So as we move through our week this week, the invitation is to find those places where you might be tempted not to love and to choose love instead, to be the vehicle, the expression of givingness that is God in form as you as me, as all life. And so as we lean into this proposition of loving without condition, I trust that it is easy and grace-filled for each one and that it lifts us up and it gives us more joy than we could imagine as we begin to see the allness of God in everyone we come in contact with. I'm so grateful for this highest truth, this one infant reality as it continues to show up in the world over and over and over again. And I say yes to life. And I anchor this prayer in gratitude and blessings for all the ones who are willing to know love, to experience love, to receive love, to give love, and to make the world around them a more loving experience. And so it is with gratitude that I simply release this prayer. I know the power of the one mind and the one love and the law to carry it forward for each one. And so we simply release it. And together we agree with this and anchor it in that same love by saying, And so it is.